In this session, we're going to have a look at language paper two, question four, with the aim of just revising how to respond to this question in the exam. So this is an overview of each of the papers for the language GCSE. I just wanted to show you this to show you where question four falls in the paper. So it's 16 marks and it's the last question in the reading section. You have to evaluate two sources and talk about their use of methods as well. For this question specifically, you have to compare perspectives. So think for a second, what does the word perspective mean? What words also have similar meanings? You can pause this video until you're ready to move on. So a perspective is somebody's point of view on a particular topic. When you're talking about perspectives, you could also use the word opinion. You could use the word attitude or you could refer to somebody's ideas instead. Now, when you're talking about somebody's perspective on something, it's really important to understand the things that can influence their perspective or your perspective on certain topics. Now, the most obvious one is your age, but there are others too, and they include your gender, your religion, your ethnicity, the country that you were born in and where you live now, perhaps, your life experiences, your education, whether you're an insider or outsider, meaning whether you really have a connection with the topic that you're talking about or whether you're just someone who seems to have come across it at a glance and not really given it a second thought. Because if you have a topic such as, I don't know, camping, for instance, and you ask your perspective on camping, if you've had positive experiences with camping, that, that could show that you're an insider because you've got relatable experiences to that topic. Whereas if you've never been camping and you don't see the point in it, then you might be classed as an outsider, so someone who sees the topic without really having any direct experience with it. Then you've got your expectations on something, so what you hope to gain from a particular thing. And then you've got who you're talking to and the medium that you're using. So obviously who you're talking to very much impacts how you speak to them and what you say and what you don't say, but the way in which you talk to them as well has a direct impact. So you could be talking to somebody by text, you could be talking to somebody on the internet, through social media, or it could be somebody face to face. All of these things influence your perspective of topics of the world. A perspective is, I'd like us to have a look at the question. Now, the question we're focusing on for this session is a question about camping. And it says, for this question, you need to refer to the whole of source A together with the whole of source B. It will always say you need to compare the whole text. So don't worry about getting your quotes or your ideas from specific lines because it doesn't matter for this question. Now, the next bit is that it says to compare how the writers convey their thoughts and feelings about, and then it will give you a topic. Now, I've said this one's camping, but this is the word that changes every single time. Everything else stays the same in this question. It will always give you as well some ideas to what to include. So it says in your answer, you could compare the different attitudes to camping, meaning that you have to identify what the writer's perspective in each source is, what their opinion is, what they think of camping in this instance, and then you have to compare them. It says compare the methods the writer uses to convey their attitudes as well. So this is referring back to your use, um, or sorry, your ability to analyse language or structure, which is AO2, and be able to explain the effects of this language or structure. And then to support your ideas with references to both texts. So this just asks you to use quotes to back up what you're saying. I'm going to start by reading source A. Now time is tight on this paper so it's important that you read actively, meaning that as you read you need to make sure you've got an ear out, an eye out for the writer's perspective at the start of the source, so that's roughly the first 15 lines, and then 
whether their perspective changes after that point. So just as you read, think about what their ideas towards camping are, how they feel, and then highlight anything that you think is important as you go along. You can pause this video now and read the extract for yourself at your own pace, or you can read along with me on the screen and just highlight your own copy. Is an extract from The Tent, The Book It and Me, in which Emma Kennedy describes her camping holidays in France in the 1970s. You know, said my mother, who, as far as I could tell, was the only person delighted to be back in France. We should treat this holiday as the occasion it is. There's no point in being miserable. Holidays are what you make them. Holidays were not what you made them. Holidays were in the hands of malevolent forces, hell-bent on wreaking chaos at every turn. Holidays were assault courses of the mind and body, endurance tests designed to break spirits and shatter spleens. In my nine years on the planet, I had learned one thing. Going on holiday was awful. As we sat chugging along through the French countryside, some flowers in the fields on either side of us, I thought, yes, it is nice to look at, but in the same way that cheese looks nice in a mousetrap. Eventually, we arrived at the campsite where we had stayed the previous year. As, in, as is often the way when you revisit somewhere you've been before, the allure was not quite sparkling. The table tennis hut, once such an astonishment of riches, was now a bit battered around the edges, the pool a little more dull. Even my mother was forced to concede that the place had lost its gloss. This isn't quite as nice as I remember it, she said, hands on hips. Still, at least it's a bit cooler. What a relief. Storm clouds gathering over there, said Dad, looking up to the west. That'll explain the drop in temperature. Still, I'll get the tent up. So have a think for a second. What do you think the writer's perspective is at the start? When does this begin to change if it does? And how do they seem to feel at the end, which we'll get to in a second. It continues. I will pitch back onto the line of trees that acted as a windbreaker between us and the river. I wandered off, tiptoeing through the branches to stand at the water's edge. The low evening sun was casting a pink tinge across the water and dragonflies were hovering. Picking up a round flat stone, I skimmed it across the surface of the lake and watched with satisfaction as it bounced away. Sometimes it was the simplest things that provided the greatest pleasure and, as I stood, Throwing stone after stone, I felt a real contentment, as if I were actually enjoying myself. I returned to our pitch, having been called to supper by my mother. Dad was staring skywards. Those clouds are shifting, he said. We might get some rain after all. I can't remember the last time I saw rain, answered my mother. Must be well over a month. It'll be nice. Clear the air. Suddenly... There was a squall of activity all over the campsite as the sky darkened and the rain began to fall in thick, steady drops. Caravan awnings were being winched in, windows slammed shut, towels were being hastily gathered and everywhere families were retreating to the inside of their tents. Because the ground was so dry, the patter of rain on the hard earth sounded almost metallic and each raindrop sparked plume of dust so fine it looked like steam, making the soil look as if it were boiling. In the distance, a low rumble of thunder began rolling towards us, the starter flag for any decent storm. And the rain, which had an individual and random quality, became more pack-like, shifting shapes like a flock of starlings. The storm was circling the area before clattering in to do its worst. Soon, the rain was slashing down, the relentless battering against the tent canvas loud and frightening. So again, what do you think the writer's perspective on camping is at the start? How does it begin to change if it does at all? And how do they seem to feel towards the end? Despite all my father's best efforts to waterproof the tent and lay the ground sheet properly, water was starting to seep in. 
the ground dry from so many weeks without moisture couldn't cope with the sudden onslaught and the campsite was rapidly turned into a series of streaming rivers not wanting to get our bedding wet we bundled our sleeping bags together placing them on top of the camping table just outside the sleeping compartment with nothing to sleep in and the water ever rising dad placed my airbed on top of their airbed and we sat huddled together knees against our chests as the storm fractured the skies we clung together terrified and despite the small but intense gnawing in my chest there was something deliciously spine tingling about being trapped inside the tent while hell rained itself down on me so again we're at the end of the extract now what do you think the writer's perspective is at the start how does this begin to change if it does at all and how do they seem to feel at the end you could think specifically about the writer's views on camping and then maybe their view changes slightly as we start to get um, more interesting events as the weather starts to turn and the rain starts to seep in. I'm going to read source B. So exactly the same. Think about what the writer's perspective is at the start of the source. That's roughly the first 15 lines. And then after that, does their perspective stay the same or change? Uh, highlight any quotes that you could use as evidence and don't forget you're focusing on their attitude or perspective on camping. An extract from In the Wilderness, written in 1878 by the American writer Charles Dudley Warner. At this time, some Americans were looking for adventure by camping in the wild. You can either pause the video to read the extract yourself or you can listen along in the video now. Either way, make sure you're thinking about the writer's perspective, so their point of view at the start, whether it begins to change and when it begins to change and how do they feel at the end. The real enjoyment of camping in the woods lies in a return to primitive conditions of living, dress and food and an escape from civilization. It is wonderful to see how easily the limits of society fall off. When our campers come to the bank of a lovely lake that where they hope to enter the primitive life, everything is beautiful and unspoilt. There is a point of land jutting into the lake, sloping down to the sandy beach, on which the waters idly lap. The forest is untouched by the axe. Ranks of slender fir trees are marshalled by the shore. The discoverers of this paradise, which they have entered to destroy, Note the babbling of the stream that flows close at hand. They hear the splash of the leaping fish. They listen to the sweet song of the evening birds and the chatter of the red squirrel who angrily challenges their right to be there. The site is for a shelter. Sorry, the site for a shelter is selected. The whole group is busy with the foundation of a new home. The axes resound in the echoing spaces. Great trunks fall with a crash. Views are open towards the lake and mountains. The spot for the shelter is cleared of underbrush. Forked stakes are driven into the ground, cross pieces are laid on them, and poles sloping back to the ground. In an incredible space of time, there is a skeleton of a house, which is entirely open in front. The roof and sides must be covered. For this purpose, the trunks of great spruce trees are skinned. It needs to be but a few of these skins to cover the roof, and they make a perfectly watertight roof, except for when it rains. Whilst we eat supper, a drop or two of rain falls. The sky darkens, the wind rises. There's a kind of shiver in the woods. We skid away into the shelter, taking the remains of our supper, eating it as best as we can. The rain increases. The fire sputters and fumes. All the trees are dripping, dripping, and the ground is wet. We cannot step outdoors without getting a drenching. Like sheep, we are penned in the little hut, where no one can stand upright. The rain swirls into the open front and wets the bottom of our blankets. We curl up in our sleeping rows and try to enjoy ourselves. How much better off we are than many a shelterless wretch. However, as we are dropping off to sleep, somebody unfortunately notes a drop of water on his face. He moves his head to a dry place. 
Then he feels a dampness in his back and he finds a puddle of water soaking through his blanket. By this time, somebody inquires if it's possible that the roof leaks. One man has a stream of water under him. Another says it's coming into his ear. The roof appears to be a discriminating sieve. Those who are dry see no need of such a fuss. The man in the corner spreads his umbrella and the protective measure is resented by his neighbour. In the darkness there is recrimination. The rain continues to soak down. The fire is only half alive. The bedding is damp. Some sit up, if they can find a dry spot to sit on, and smoke. A few sleep, and the night wears on. The morning opens cheerless. The sky is still leaking, and so is the shelter. The roof is patched up. Even if the storm clears, the woods are soaked. There's no chance of going out. The world is only ten feet square. This life without responsibility or even clean clothes, may continue as long as the camper desires. Some would be happy to live in this free fashion forever, in rain or sun, but there are others who cannot exist more than three days without their worldly baggage. These campers will soon leave and the abandoned camp is a melancholy sight. So what do you think the writer's perspective is here at this point? Has it changed at all so far? Woods have been despoiled, the stumps are ugly, the bushes are scorched, the pine leaf strewn earth is trodden into mud, the ground is littered with all the unsightly debris of a hand to hand life. The dismantled shelter is a shabby object, the touch charred and blackened logs where the fire blazed suggest the extinction of life. Man has wrought his usual wrong upon nature. So again, at the end of this extract, does the writer's opinion seem to change? I think it was always there that they seem to dislike the impact that humans camping in the wilderness had upon nature. But I think it becomes more and more obvious as the extract goes on. However, their, their fun loss of camping is ever present. So are the two perspectives similar or different? Just pause the video and make a few notes on your extracts if you'd like. And then think about how they're different. So now we've got our ideas about how these extracts are similar and different, we need to think about how to write up our ideas in a response that will get us the marks that we need. You are going to aim to write three paragraphs for this question. First of all, you're going to write a comparative paragraph that focuses on exploring big ideas and what the quote suggests without focusing on language. So in this paragraph, you're going to write one paid structure on source A. You're then going to include a connective or a connecting sentence to support your link from source A to source B. Maybe you could think about how the perspective is similar or how it's different to source B. And then you're going to write one paid structure on source B. And that will all form one paragraph, one comparative paragraph. Your next paragraph is going to be a language analysis paragraph or a salial paragraph where you find a language rich quote and you analyse the writer's use of language and the effects of the language. Then you're going to write for your third paragraph another comparative paragraph where you talk about the writer's big ideas and how their perspectives are presented through a PEED structure for source A, add another connecting sentence, and then a PEED structure for source B. Now, the difference between paragraphs one and three is that in paragraph one, you're going to focus on extracts, or sorry, quotes taken from the beginning of the extract. And then in paragraph three, you're going to focus on quotes taken from the end of the extracts in the last couple of paragraphs.
this question, we need to write these three paragraphs up. So we'll do this for the rest of the session. The first paragraph is a paragraph where you are comparing the writer's perspectives at the start of the extracts and you're not focusing on language analysis, you're focusing, focusing on the big ideas instead. So you're writing one big paragraph where you do a PED structure on source A, you include that comparative sentence to show whether the ideas are similar or different to source B, and then you use a PED structure again. Let's have a go. On your handout, you have a model paragraph. It's exactly the same as the one on the screen now. So if you'd like to read it to yourself for a moment, feel free, just pause the video and then come back. But if you'd like me to read it, just carry on listening. The whole point of this is that you're going to think about how this paragraph compares the two sources and you're going to highlight any of the keywords or sentences that are comparing the two. And then in a different colour, I'd like you to highlight where there's an explanation of the writer's point of view. So you're looking for two key things there. So it says, both sources focus on the challenges of camping, such as the unreliable weather and the lack of comfort. However, source B is much more enthusiastic than source A. In source A, the writer's attitude is predominantly pessimistic at the beginning. So we've got the reference to the beginning there. The writer says that camping is an assault cause of the mind and body, suggesting that camping is full of physical discomfort and plenty of unexpected or emotionally challenging situations. The writer seems to think that camping holidays are not fun and relaxing, like you'd expect a holiday to be, but still full of disappointment instead. On the other hand, the writer of Source B begins by romanticising the idea of camping by describing the beauty of the natural setting. The phrase sloping down to a sandy beach suggests a simple, gentle descent towards the lake, contributing to the overall picturesque and inviting nature of the camping site. Sandy beaches are often associated with relaxation and recreational enjoyment, further enhancing the positive image of the camping location. They also use phrases such as beautiful and wonderful, which suggest that campers experience joy and that the writer finds delight in camping. It is clear that the writer in Source B was looking for excitement, while the writer in Source A was on holiday and perhaps had different expectations. So now you've listened to the paragraph, pause the video and make sure you've followed the instructions on the screen. So you should have something like this for your answers. The good thing about this paragraph is that it begins with a comparison. We begin with the word both, which is an excellent opening word to make sure you talk about both sources together. We make it clear as well that we're focusing on source A at the start after that initial sentence. It says in source A, the writer's attitude is predominantly pessimistic at the beginning. We also add an appropriate quote in quotation marks. And then we comment on the writer's perspective and what we think is influencing it there in green. Then we use a connective to link to source B. So it says, on the other hand, the writer of source B begins by romanticising the idea of camping by describing the beauty of the natural setting. Then we have an appropriate quote from source B. And then we've got another clear explanation and then a final sentence in blue at the end, linking the two ideas together. Now it's your turn. Find a quote from each extract and write your own comparative paragraph using the P to C P to structure. It's not very flashy in terms of the name, but it really works in terms of the structure. So a P structure to begin with, all about source A. Then include a connecting sentence to support your link to source B. Maybe think about how the perspective is similar or different to source B and then another PED structure, and that's your first paragraph complete. If you need any help or support with thinking about the writer's perspective, there are some keywords that you might want to use on the left-hand side of the screen. Pause the video and then come back when you're done. 
you've had a good go and that's your first paragraph complete for language paper two question four now we're going to have a look at the language analysis paragraph so the or paragraph that you're going to do is your second paragraph paragraph two you need to think about how the writer in your favorite of the two sources uses language to convey their perspective this response, so this structure that you're going to use is exactly the same as the structure we ask you to use in question three on this paper and question two on language paper one. So you're focusing on using a salial structure. I'd like you now to skim through your favourite source and highlight or underline any quote that you could use. These quotes should be language rich, so look for language features and keywords that you can analyse. Pause the video and then come back when you're done. If you haven't found a quote, you can use my quote on the screen. It's the babbling of the stream that flows close at hand. They hear the splash of the leaping fish. And what you need to do with your quote is follow the steps on the screen. I won't ask you to stop and pause the video at the end of every step, but if you need to pause the video at certain points, just go ahead and then come back to it when you're ready. So step one is to underline any words that you feel you could comment on the effect of. So any words that you think are particularly effective, any words that you think will stand out. I've got babbling, the phrase close at hand, splash and leaping. Then you need to think of the terminology that's used in this quote. I've got a couple of instances of onomatopoeia. I've got the prepositional phrase close at hand to describe how near the stream is to the writer. And then we've got the dynamic verb leaping. The next thing is to comment on the effect of these words. So what do these words show? What are the connotations of the words? And step four is all about how this shows the writer's perspective. I'm going to do step three and step four in one, and I'm going to give you some ideas, but there are plenty more that you could think about as well. So for the onomatopoeic babbling, we've got the idea that it's a murmuring sound, it's gentle, it's rhythmic, and it creates this calming environment for the writer. Perhaps they feel that camping is quite a calming, relaxing experience, which is quite contradictory to source A. Then we've got the phrase close at hand, showing that they've got, when they're camping, a personal connection with nature. It's quite inviting. We've got the word splash, which is quite playful, which gives us a rich image full of sensory language there, which is quite immersive to the reader. And then we've got the verb leaping, which creates this sense of a burst of energy in the natural setting. So perhaps nature is quite rejuvenating here. Either way, whether you've used the quote on the screen or whether you've used your own quote, hopefully by now you've created notes and made notes on those four steps because you're going to write up all of your ideas in a TQEE paragraph in a second. Now it's time to write your paragraph two. How does the writer in your favourite source use methods to convey his or her perspective? It's a slew paragraph. So make sure you've got your language rich quote ready and then write a statement that responds to this task. Label your technique, add your evidence, explain the meaning of the quote you've chosen. Start with the easiest ideas first and then analyse in as much detail as you can. Any keywords, phrases, any of the features or techniques you can pick out. Think about what else the quote suggests. What is the writer trying to show us? What does the writer want us to think? And then when you're done, link your ideas back to your main point. If you've got to this point, you've written your first comparative paragraph and then your salial paragraph, which focuses on language analysis in your preferred source. That means that the only paragraph you've got left is another comparative paragraph taking quotes from the end of the extracts. So let's look at paragraph three. 
Does the perspective in source A change as you move through the source Y? Compare this to source B, does their perspective change or does it stay the same and why? Well, we said that at the start, the writer of source A immediately seems to dislike camping, while the writer of source B is much more optimistic. So I'd like you to read through source A, think about it. Does this writer's perspective stay the same all the way through? See if you can find a quote which shows how the writer stays disappointed or perhaps changes their mind. When you're done, read through source B and again select a quote which shows how this perspective stays the same or changes. Just pause the video until you're done. Now think, how could we compare the perspectives of source A and source B and how they've changed or stayed the same? This is your task for the final, or perhaps paragraph, if you're running short on time in the exam. This is your final paragraph, paragraph three. You're writing a comparative paragraph comparing the latter halves of source A and source B. You should have already thought about whether the perspectives of each writer changes as each source develops. You could include these ideas in your response as well. So begin with a PED structure focusing on source A. When you've explained your ideas using your quote and then developed ideas, thinking about multiple different interpretations, any other inferences you can make, etc., you can then add your connective, so your connecting sentence. This is a sentence that supports the link from source A to source B, and it's all about how the perspective is similar or different with either source. Then you repeat the page structure for source B, and that is the end of your last comparative paragraph. So pause the video, have a go. Don't forget to think about whether the perspectives change as the sources develop, and then why that might be if that is the case. Have a go. Hopefully now you have completed three paragraphs for language paper two, question four on this set of sources. Two of those paragraphs are comparative paragraphs and one is a SLEAL paragraph focusing on language analysis. Well done.